great, great, great to see you, man. I, I really, really appreciate uh, that you are taking the time to speak with me. Uh, and I want to congratulate you on your new White, Cup, uh, White Cups contract and also the exciting new role, manager Thank of, you. of community impact. Uh, that, yeah. I mean, that's so cool, you know, that the player is starting off, um, he's starting his off-field career, basically during the time he's playing for the club. Uh, can you quickly tell, tell us a little bit about it, about what, you, what you're going to do, basically? Um, yeah, well, a little background. I mm -hmm. started my internship last year while playing. So I got a whole year to gain experience, learn about the role, um, basically see how to balance both. And, mm -hmm. you know, I did quite a good job doing that. So this year, obviously a year older, a year closer to the end, but um, with a year of experience. So it was the right time to um, solidify that deal in the office, uh, manager community impact. And um, yeah, so basically in this role, I, in simple terms, I have a role to impact the community in a positive way, you know, through initiatives, projects, connecting with the fans, connecting with the city of Vancouver, and really bridging the gap between players, front office, the whole organization, and the city of Vancouver. Um, but not only that, they um, open their doors to me in a way where I can learn about different departments, learn about partnerships, learn about branding, learn about the whole ticketing and events, and um, really in a good good position to learn about the entire club as a whole. Amazing, amazing! So, uh, really, I, when I when I saw that you, you you know you published it on LinkedIn, I said, "Whoa!" You know, such a such a healthy organization. You know putting a player with, you know, with experience, we've seen a lot from world football in, in such a, a vital position in, in modern football, the connection with the community, the connection with the fans really inspired me. This for sure, we, we, we will include a written text about it in Babagol in, I think after the, after the international break, you know, because from now we are only dealing with, uh, with the qualifiers and the World Cup, which is another reason yeah. I want to speak with you uh, as I explained, Nathan, we are recording a narrative podcast in Hebrew and Arabic. It's part of the Israeli okay. Public Broadcast Corporation uh, on the Canadian football and the Canadian national team progress. That uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You have a vast uh, part and experience in in the past decade, and you've been with Canada men's team since 2011 to 2020. 61 caps, 17 goals. Um, so to say, I want to ask you, how was it when you just joined the national team? I mean, atmosphere, agenda, approach, and was there a real project back then in the beginning of, of the last decade? And what are the differences between those times and the national team nowadays or in the last era you've been part of the, of the national team? I mean, when I first joined the national team, obviously there's that huge excitement, you know, a young player. I think my first camp, I was 22 years old. So I was only playing in Finland then, not the biggest football country, or the biggest club in the world. And then when I went to, when I got my first call up to the national teams, there was guys in England, Bundesliga, La Liga. So it was a huge step for me. And for me, it was the biggest thing in the world. Um, back then, I wasn't thinking about Oh, how is the program? I wasn't thinking about, you know, is the program doing the right things? Are we taking the right steps? Are on the business side, are we promoting the players the right way? You know, I was only thinking about this is an opportunity now for me. And, you know, this has been my dream to play for the national team. And now I'm here, you know, it's all, all excitement. But looking back at it now with all the experience I've had over the years and all the caps and all the games, um, there is a new, there's a new identity to the team now that was lacking in the past, you know, back, back when I was younger, it felt more like it was less, not, it was a privilege, but the players were almost bigger than the program. Hmm. If that makes sense, you know, like players were coming in and great players, but it was a different attitude coming in than it is now, you know, now there's players playing at the highest levels, across the world playing and performing at the highest levels, Champions League. Um, you see Alfonso at Bayern Munich, you see Jonathan David at Lille, 
You see Kyle Lahren in, in Turkey at Besiktas doing big things. You see moves, players going from MLS to big clubs in Belgium and, and all over the world. So there's a different attitude and more of a belief that this is our time. This is the group of players. And I don't think anything's going to stop, stop us stop us from getting to the World Cup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I must admit, you know, I, my focus on my career is basically Middle Eastern football. Uh, everything that, you know, taking place from Morocco to Iran, basically. But if there is one national team that gets me, you know, buzzing and exciting to see is Canada. I, I haven't missed a game in the, in the first stage of qualifications because the change is so big. And in the episode that we are recording, we are touching a special moment uh, the infamous 8-1 loss to Honduras that you've been uh, part of. Yeah. Um, what was the Still feeling? Hurts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, 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 what was the feeling going up to play in San Pedro de Sula? The day, you know, I've seen the video is ecstatic. What are the re- and what also were the reactions, you know, after the match? And also, do you see this match as a trigger, maybe, to this big change that you were describing in the, in the previous uh, question? Because 10 years from then, it's a completely different Canada. Yeah, I mean, I remember leading up to the match, we needed a tie to go through to the, the hex it was then. It was a six-team six round. Um, but yeah, you know, the, the vibes were good. We had a couple of big injuries leading up to that game. So I got the start being one of the younger players on the, or I think the youngest player on the team, one of them. And um, also my other teammate, Simeon Jackson, got the start too because of an uh, injury as well. So it was a tough atmosphere. You know, Honduras is tough for any national team to go in and, and get a result. Um, I think back then they were a better side, better better players and um, just the organization might have been in better shape back then mm-hmm. and um, yeah I mean going there we, we we pull up to the game two and a half hours before I remember just driving up to the game the the president or whatever made it a national holiday so nobody worked that day everyone was coming to the stadium driving up to the game like 10 kilometers out you see people along the roads, cars, and they're looking at you and they're doing this and they're doing this. And you see signs like, you know, this is the end for you. You know, you will not leave here. Um, You will die here, you know. And I'm like looking at this as a young national team player, like what is going on, you know? (laughs) Very hostile, very hostile. Like definitely the most hostile environment I've ever played in in my life. And then you get to the stadium and, you know, it's pregame. You think it's going to be quiet. As soon as the bus pulls up, you hear the Vuvuzelas. Ah, Stadium full, two hours out of the game. I'm like, what is going on? So, like, leading up to the game, very intimidating. But obviously, you know, we're we're soccer players. You know, this is what we're about. You know, you just take it in stride. But, um, yeah, you step on the pitch. It's hot. It's loud one goal it's like okay what a, okay let's go two goals three goals it's like what the hell's going on it's just one of those one of those days one of those games one of those stains on your career that like you know you look back and you're like how did it happen and you just can't you can't even fathom that 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 happened that day yeah um, and, and you think it's connected to, to the big to you think it triggered the change that we are seeing today yeah i mean obviously changed over a course of 10 years. But after that, you know, there was a lull, you know, we went down a bit, you know, people talking bad about the the organization and, you know, the players got, um, you know, abused a little bit and trampled on. But then I'm sure from that point on, Kansas soccer as an organization knew that something has to change, Mm -hmm. you know, and it was slow over the course of 10 years players coming in players coming out but I think those players watching that game decided from that point on like listen when I get to that program things are going to be different because think about it 10 years ago if Alfonso was watching that game he's 11 Jonathan David is maybe 10 you know so maybe that that period of despair disappointment across the entire nation inspired that next generation to be like when we get around and it's our time in that situation we'll do it different amazing amazing and and 
you know, uh, what, what we are trying to, to, to find in this episode uh, with one of our uh, North American sports uh, correspondents is what, what are the reasons for this mass improvement in recent years? And specifically, do you think the fact that uh, there are three Canadian clubs in the MLS and it really helped, you know, in, in growing the, the football ecosystems within Canada that basically are only endorsing a professional league for four years now, after almost 30 years without a professional league, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the biggest, the biggest trigger to this success is that there's, there's more quality environments where young players can train. I think back when I was growing up, I had nothing. You know, I had my club team. And then finally, when I realized at the age of 16, like I got to do something because I'm playing basically high school soccer and there was the national team development program, but not all the players were at the level of, of even close to professional. So there was not much opportunities for players to get quality training in an environment that they can feel like a professional and see what it's like to be a professional. So when I was 16, I had the opportunity to go to Chile for a year and I took it. I left high school. I went to Chile. I trained with a team called Santiago Morning for a year in a professional mm -hmm. environment. And as soon as I came back and trained with my regular colleagues, I was 10 levels higher. Mm -hmm. I immediately got a national team call up, but that's like what was missing. But now you have that in Canada. It started with Toronto FC, Montreal Impact and Vancouver Whitecaps opening up academies which can cultivate these players, show them what it's like to be a professional and kind of bridge the gap of what you see in European clubs. And like I, in Turkey, you know, those kids are training from a youth in the program. Even when I was in Romania, those young kids were every day training at a high level in a professional environment. And now that you have that in Canada, these kids are getting opportunities to train and become professionals or the, develop the professional mindset earlier on and that's just that's just you know that's what you need to become a strong powerful football country and national team indeed 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 great you, you know the, um, i'm happy that you are saying that because it means the research we did is was good <laughs> because uh, everywhere we understood that basically the the focal point was the, the fact that toronto montreal vancouver really build it build it organization that basically in the us they didn't build it the same they didn't build it with the same academics and this yeah. mix of European uh, education of football. And uh, yeah, uh, I don't and keep in mind when you have when you add that to the fact that, you know, Canada is so multicultural. You mm -hmm. have families from all over the world. You have kids from all different backgrounds and we're a very athletic country, you know. So if you mix that athleticism with that multiculturalism of the country, and then you add some soccer infrastructure to it, some football infrastructure and some football minds teaching the next generation, you really have some special athletes with special abilities that are just needing that soccer intelligence. Amazing. Amazing. Um, now we are a quick part, a different part a little bit, okay? It's basically, I will tell you a name of someone uh, that we are focusing on uh, or putting the spotlight on it in this episode, besides mm -hmm. of you, of course, participating. And I want you to give me a, in, a, in a short phrase, you know, your take on their contribution to the Canadian football and Canadian national team. Okay. Okay. Okay, great. Coach John Herdman. <laughs> the ultimate motivator. He is meticulous passionate he is uh he's a leader you know and when you have such a special group of players you need a strong leader that can unite everyone create a brotherhood and really get everyone fighting for the same goal and he has accomplished that amazing uh, captain atiba hutchinson <laughs> one of my mentors <laughs> When I first came into the program, he was there. When I left the program, he's still there. You know, he is um, the ultimate professional, um, as humble as can be, um, truly a model, model person, model Canadian athlete. 
and somebody that any youth player, any soccer player could look up and idolize, you know, a good friend of mine, um, great person, love the guy. Yeah, yeah, this is the vibes I get from him also, and I don't know him, so it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, um, great guy. Milan Borja. <laughs> yeah. Me and Milan got our first cap together in Greece. Um, very good friend of mine as well. Um, great goalkeeper, great passion, great energy, big shot stopper, big moment, uh, big moment player, uh, great leader. And, uh, you know, he's, he's somebody that can lighten the, lighten the mood in any situation. So definitely a key, key part to the whole cog. Amazing, amazing. And uh, finally, Alfonso Davis. <sighs> Big talent, um, superstar. Um, also a fellow Edmontonian. We grew up in the same city. Um, but he paved the path for a lot of those young players to get into the highest environments in the world. You know, if he goes, if he goes to Bayern and doesn't succeed, maybe there's a different attitude towards young Canadian players. So for me, he's, he's blazed in a new path. And then in that path, you see Jonathan David, Tejan Buchanan, Kyle Lahren, all these guys get into the highest, highest levels in Europe because of his success and his influence on the game. Amazing. And finally, to say, uh, do you think Canada will qualify for the 2022 World Cup? And if so, which is likely uh, we, are, we are looking at the table, it's, it's amazing. How far they can get in Qatar? <laughs> I, 100% they can qualify. Mm -hmm. um, it could happen this window. Mm -hmm. And in Qatar, in World Cup, as you've seen in the past, anything is possible. And this group is determined, they're fighters, they have the talent, they have the speed, they have, have, they have, they have the athleticism, they have the guidance through their, their coaches and leaders. Um, I feel once they get to the World Cup and like we see in football, anything is possible. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Last word, if, if I may, a uh, final, final question for, for the, the Israeli audience that, uh, you know, the, they will listen to this podcast and probably remembers you um, from your season in uh, Apoel Haifa. Um, if you can briefly, you know, share, share your memories of Israeli football. Was it a good year, a bad year? Basically, you are a forward and you played most of the years yeah. as a right back. <laughs> yeah. Um, very interesting moment in my career. Um, obviously came in as a striker, but you know the foreign rules. We had a lot of strikers. Mm -hmm. um, we lost our coach. He got fired early on. A new coach came in and, you know, we had an injury at right back. And that week leading, or leading up to the game against Maccabi Tel Aviv. So he asked me, he's like, you're You're one of the only players I see that could do well here as a right back. You know, you're capable of getting up and down the line, more like a wing back type of feel. Mm -hmm. And I just said, sure, you know, obviously not happy with, with that. But um, I just said, sure, you know, I'll do it. And we won the game 2-0. And I think I was mad at the match. Yeah. Um, shut down their best player. I think it was Zahavi. <laughs> um, and and played, played very well. But... Um, Yeah, I see it as maybe that could have been something, you know, if I would have stuck with it, which they wanted me to stay and, and, and still be a right back, mm -hmm. that could have maybe brought me to another level of football in a different environment where I'm playing as a right back because I felt comfortable there. Mm -hmm. For me, it was almost boring because it was, it was, I wasn't attacking. I was so fast that I wasn't getting beat easily. And it was very, it felt very easy for me. But, you know, my passion is being a striker, scoring goals, and that's what I did my whole career. So who knows what it could have been if I would have really embraced the right back position. And like you've seen with other players, like Alfonso started as a, as a winger, as an attacker, and really excelled when he, the further back he, he got pushed back. So um, I always see it as something what could have been, you know, but my time in Israel was amazing. I loved Haifa. You know, I really enjoyed my time in the country. I have a good friend that, that, um, that was with me there the whole time. Um, 
so like I only have good memories of both Haifa and Israel and I and I do miss it and I can I hope I can get back one day. Ah inshallah inshallah we'll see you here one day. <laughs> to say really appreciate your time. I will now release you to go to breakfast. And Thank you. Good it was nice speaking with you. Nice speaking with Take you. Take care. You too man. Bye bye.